Planet Classroom. I am Orb. Join me as your virtual guide on a journey of global learning called Planet Classroom. You will hear stories from artists, musicians, dancers, technologists, game makers, filmmakers, innovators, and creators of all kinds from around the world. It's time to engage our imaginations, share our ideas, and explore solutions for a brighter future for all. Our planet is a classroom where learning together brings us together. Youth climate activists continue to capture the world's attention. Net Zero is the acclaimed series in which youth leaders from the Protect Our Planet movement, in association with Planet Classroom, track the progress being made by international leaders to tackle the climate crisis. Today on Planet Classroom, we are delighted to showcase four hosts from the Net Zero series. Nahid Perez Ayala, Kalan Nibonrich Kiman, Levi Narenda, and Cherry Sum to discuss where the world stands in the race to net zero. Carbon capture and storage technologies are recognized as effective ways to reduce carbon emissions. Daniel P. Schrag is the Sturgis Hooper Professor of Geology at Harvard University, Professor of Environmental Science and Engineering and Director of the Harvard University Center for the Environment. Schrag served on President Obama's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. Net Zero's climate activist Nahid Perez Ayala interviewed Schrag to explore the policies that should take priority for the world to achieve Net Zero. I decided to interview Professor Daniel Schrag because of his experience in energy technology and policy, including carbon capture and storage and low carbon synthetic fuels. In addition, I'm interested in his work in geochemistry and climatology. I was surprised in the interview by his comments about achieving net zero and the fact that no country is on track to meet the aspirations that they committed to at COP26. However, people need to change their habits and their demands in order to change the supply. The public ultimately have to be willing to pay the extra cost of clean energy. It's the responsibility of some of the larger economies to take a serious role in moving technologies forward as they transition to becoming cheaper and better. I think one of my main takeaways from our conversation is that coal is responsible for a little less than half of global emissions of CO2. There are many countries in the world that rely heavily on coal as a source of energy for electricity generation because it is relatively cheap and abundant. However, it's by far the deadliest fuel in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, but also in terms of conventional pollution and its effects on public health. Burning coal is just bad for people's health, and we should stop using it. We discussed how the ambition and profits of some people outweigh the environmental and health impacts of using coal as an energy source. We also talked about how people can come up with various types of budgets for how much fossil fuel we can use to stay under any target, like 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees, but it's just not realistic in terms of the way that the world is con it's currently trending. Shrag believes that we still have a window of opportunity to make positive change, including switching to renewables such as electric transportation. We could accelerate the transition to electric vehicles all over the world by incentivizing new factories being built. We can't change oil demand with EVs in the next six months, but over the next three years, we could make a significant difference. Thank you, Nahid, for your perspectives on your interview with Dan Shrag. Can agroforestry help mitigate climate change and remove CO2 from our air permanently? In 2021, Jamaica targeted an ambitious 60% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. The new goal addressed land use change, forestry emissions, and committing to deeper emission reductions in the energy sector. Net Zero's climate activist Kalan Nibonrich Kiman interviewed Una May Gordon, the principal director of climate change for the Jamaican government to ascertain what climate strategies are helping Jamaica achieve its race to net zero. I chose to interview Principal Director Uname Garden because I wanted to highlight both the presence of female leadership and the perspective of small island developing states in the climate change discussion. So we are trying to, to work now um, with the municipal cooperation, um, a couple of the cooperation to strengthen their own capacity to drive climate action at the local level. 
Director Gordon's work highlights traditional indigenous agricultural ways and the contributions to mitigating climate change. What surprised me most in my interview with Unami was the fact that a comprehensive study of mangroves will be added to the national strategy. Start to value, place a value on the land that we have, that finite resource that we have. My main takeaways from our interview are, first, indigenous knowledge needs to play a role in policy development. If we don't value that indigenous knowledge that people have and turn it into asset and help it to inform policy, I think we, are, we have a problem. Secondly, land is a valuable asset and we need to make the best decisions regarding land use. If we place a real value on it, then the relationship between the people and the land would change. Finally, we as a people need to find the ecosystem balance that allows us to live in harmony with our environment. Thank you, Kalam, for your perspectives on your interview with Una May Gordon. The world loses about 15 billion trees a year. Conserving, restoring, and growing new trees helps biodiversity and fights climate change. What solutions are leaders in Africa using to reverse the loss of trees? Dr. Susan Chamba is the Director of Vital Landscapes at the World Resources Institute. Net Zero's climate activist Levi Narenda interviewed Susan to discuss the issues of forest restoration, food system supply, carbon emission reduction, and the role technology is playing in solving the climate challenges faced in Africa. I decided to interview Dr. Susan because I was inspired by her experience in forest landscape restoration works and the contribution her work is making towards the transformation of sustainable food system. African farmers, smallholder farmers are struggling with drought, they are struggling with flooding, they are struggling to adapt to a rapidly changing climate that they did very little to contribute to. Dr. Susan was named one of the Global Landscape Forum 16 Women Restoring the Earth in 2021. And she is also a distinguished global ambassador for the race to zero under the UN's Champions for Climate Action. I think I learned a lot of new information about greenhouse gases, in this interview and the role Africa plays. Africa accounts for the smallest share of global greenhouse gas emission, just, just about 3.8%, which is in contrast to the 20, 23% in China, 19% in the USA, and 13% in the European Union. However, we have to understand that our economy is particularly vulnerable to the climate change, and we need to tackle the issues caused by it now and right now. If we want big carbon emission emission reductions, that has to come from industrialized countries, that has to come from countries that have historically been big emitters. So my conversation with uh, Dr. Susan helped me to better understand the climate challenges we are facing globally. An important takeaway from our interview is firstly that technology plays an important role in helping to restore the environment in the forest and uh, restoration works. We need to shift to those kind of uh, development pathways, whether it's in the transport, whether it's in food production, whether it's in energy, that are actually clean. Dr. Susan also emphasized that the, the important question, the important question we must ask ourselves to be, to understand before we uh, we work on, on a positive change is why. So why are we working to restore the ecosystem? And finally, uh, I also learned uh, from Dr. Susan that uh, restoration, resto restoring the forest calls for proper management and long-term maintenance of the newly planted trees. We cannot just plant trees and forget about it. If we lose our own uh, nat remaining natural forests, we will also be losing our own livelihood. Thank you, Levy, for your perspectives on your interview with Susan Chamba. How can educational systems adapt to empower students to take action on the global climate crisis? Net Zero's climate activist Cherry Sung from South Korea set out to explore how a conservative and standardized education system could implement an environmental education that empowers people. Sung interviewed Chris Didi of Harvard's Graduate School of Education to discuss his solutions. 
ADD's research includes infusing technology into large-scale educational initiatives such as climate change curricula. I wanted to interview Chris Didi because I was truly inspired by his vision of infusing digital technology to promote environmental education. I live in South Korea. The traditional education system is very standardized and focused on the exam subjects only. I believe an interdisciplinary and career-based education would not only interest students but also empower them to be independent in their learning and be prepared to respond to real-life world issues like climate change. Following the given path of digital education, I wanted to know more about how this can be actualized and what Chris has done in this research. The most surprising thing about my interview with Chris was that he mentioned how the implementation of environmental education should consider what people are used to. In order to scale up innovations from local to widespread use, innovations cannot be completely abstract because people might feel uncomfortable with them. I realized that innovations that are intended for widespread use should be part of people's everyday lives, and this should promote a feeling of connectedness. In the world today, many students have never seen even one natural ecosystem. You can't empathize with something you've never experienced. Climate change to many can be a gigantic issue that only the world authorities can solve. However, youth and public support is also critical in our response to climate change. Therefore, raising awareness via a sense of connectedness is helpful. It's easy to feel a sense of despair about climate change and the other things that we see happening to the natural world. So it's, it's very important to say that it's not too late. A key takeaway from our interview is that in order to implement environmental education, it should be inquiry based so that we can empower people. We cannot stick to a solution-based learning system where youth are constrained from being independent learners. Students need to feel two things. They need to feel relevance, that what they're learning actually has some meaning for them in their lives, and they need to feel agency. Second, a digital ecosystem would also be effective in following the future path of the world with digitalization and in responding to the 21st century's issues. Christie's EcoLearn curriculum allows students to have an opportunity to extend their learning as they embark on a field trip to a real environment, for example a pond. Their experience in the real world is enhanced by using mobile technology for science education. We want people to be advocates for change. We want people to know how to go out and make a difference in the world and band together. And that can only take place through uh, environments that are learning by doing environments and that teach you not just about ecosystems, but about how ecosystems are shaped by the world. Finally, Chris talks about how easy it is to feel a sense of despair about climate change and other environmental issues. Yet, it isn't too late. Messages about environmental education and mitigation are framed to scare people. When people are scared and feel like they cannot make a difference, they're discouraged to take action. Hence, it is important for students of any age to believe and spread the message that climate change can be prevented or at least slowed down. The Earth has powerful mechanisms for recovering from things if we give it the opportunity to do that. Thank you, Cherry, for your perspectives on your interview with Chris Deedee. We certainly have had a lot of good insights to share with you today. Thank you to all our international net zero climate activists, Nahid, Kalan, Levy, and Cherry. And thank you to the creators of the Net Zero video series, the Protect Our Planet movement, and Planet Classroom. Don't miss the original Net Zero interviews on the Planet Classroom Network, now streaming on YouTube. That's all, my human friends, for this week. I leave you with a reminder to explore your world, express yourself, discover, create, and use your imagination. Until next time, be kind, be curious, and thank you for listening. Goodbye.